Let us have a moment of silence for war photographer David Guilty, an NPR photojournalist, was killed in Afghanistan on Sunday, this past Sunday, I think it was around the 5th of June, along with NPR's Afghan interpreter, Zabahula Tamana. They were on assignment for the network, traveling with an Afghan army unit. They were in an armored Humvee driven by a soldier of the Afghan National Army. All three were killed after the Humvee was hit by a rocket-propelled grenade in an apparent ambush. When the journalist arrived, an honor guard, when his body arrived, an honor guard of dozens and dozens of U.S. soldiers stood at attention and saluted. David was 50, and Zabahullah, who for years also worked as a photographer, was 38. David was considered one of the best photojournalists in the world, with many honors. He covered wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. He covered the conflict between Israel and Hamas in Gaza, the end of apartheid in South Africa, devastating earthquakes in Haiti, famine in Somalia, and the Ebola epidemic in Liberia. Amid the rubble, he found beauty. Amid war, he found humanity. He talked about his craft. The camera, he said, made things easier. Quote, it's not like you put the camera in your face and therefore it makes what you're seeing okay. But certainly you can put yourself in a zone, David said. It's hard, but you can't get caught up in it and become part of it. You still need to maintain your state of mind that you are helping to tell this story. His craft, he said, was about more than photojournalism. It's not just reporting, not just taking pictures, he said. It's do those visuals, do the stories, do, those, do they change somebody's mind enough to take action? In an email, Michael Oreski, NPR's vice president for news, said, David died pursuing that commitment. As a man and as a photojournalist, David brought out the humanity of all of those around him, Michael said. He let us see the world and each other through his eyes. The uh, general manager, Keith Jenkins, said David and he talked a lot about the dangers of the work and how much longer he could keep doing it. Ultimately, he felt it was really important to tell those stories. Keith said. David also understood those risks. It's a very hard thing to put into words the peace you sort of make with what you're going to be doing, David said. I'm not saying you walk into those situations and you're fatalistic about it, but you're also preparing and making decisions based on the level of threat. He was a lovely man with a great eye for a story and a deep wisdom about his country. NPR's Philip Reeves said. There was a lot of praise, including a statement from the American government, to, uh, from uh, John Kerry, State Secretary. I was saddened to learn today of the death of an NPR photographer, David Gilkey, and his colleagues, Abahula Tamana. The attack is a grim reminder of the dangers that continues to face the Afghan people. It is sadder than the death of kings. As a photojournalist much of my life, not going deliberately into war zone, though I've been in a few of them by accident. I was in Lebanon during the Troubles photographing, I think it was a small church or building, and uh, two men came out holding 45 automatics and looking very unpleasant and shouting something that I couldn't understand. And my driver rushed over, grabbed me, and hauled me over to the car. You got to get out of here, he said. He wanted to get out of there before they killed us. Anytime you're in or near a war zone, you're in danger. You're in danger in many aspects of the work you do, depending on what kind of work. 
David Gilkey represented journalists. I knew a young man who was a photojournalist who came to my studio. He was a friend. He came to my studio in New York to learn the art of photography. And one day he came and he could hardly talk. He was muttering and I said, what happened? He said, well, I was over there. I'm not sure which war he was in at this point. I think it might have been uh, the Korean War or the Vietnam. He said, and uh, in the middle of what was going on, some soldier yelled at me. I didn't do what he wanted, and he smashed his rifle butt into my throat. And now I can hardly talk anymore. They fixed it as best they could. I said, oh, my gosh, I guess that's the end of going over there, isn't it? Oh, he said, I'm leaving next week. I said, what? You just got yourself nearly killed. He said, yes, he said, but I have to go there. That's what I do. Well, words to that effect. He went there because, but you see, there's another question, and I don't put anybody down for this at all. I put nobody down that goes into a war zone. If you have that kind of guts, you have to be praised. A lot of young men go to war zones because they can't get work as commercial or journalists or anything else until they make a reputation or until they're known. Well, one way to get work is to go to an editor of the news bureau and say, there's very dangerous in such and such a place, I'm willing to go. And very often, they'll get sent because nobody else wants to go. And my young friend, I think, was in that situation. He wanted to go back because that was his life. He loved the camaraderie, being in the war zone, doing something useful, the euphoria, the excitement, the adrenaline. He loved it all, and he was willing to risk his life again. And I appreciate that. I was a good friend of Cornell Kappa's brother. Cornell Kappa, of course, was a good, I mean, uh, yeah, Cornell Kappa's brother. I was a good friend of Cornell Kappa. His brother, Robert Kappa, was killed in a war. He was one of the most famous photojournalists of war. Cornell started uh, something called uh, the, uh, he started a museum of the uh, photojournalism. And it is now a very big museum, and I knew Cornell, and uh, we got along, but Cornell obviously had to deal with the exigencies of keeping his uh, museum, which was in the upper 90s on the west side, originally going. Then it moved down to the midtown Manhattan now, and it's a big, famous place. But I must point out, and I don't denigrate anybody, that everybody is showing the same kind of photography. War photography may not change. I mean, you can't do war photography where you can't recognize what's happening. But the art of photography is moving in a totally different direction. That's where I come in, but I didn't make this uh, statement to say that. I would like to call for a moment of silence for David Gilkey and for the NPR photographer, Tanneman, that was with him. To quote Abraham Lincoln, it is from these honored dead that we draw in curious devotion to that cause for, where they, for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. Of course, that's Lincoln's famous speech and uh, his Gettysburg, Gettysburg Address. But he's saying the truth to anyone that gives their lives for their country Dolce et decorum something, which is a statement that reads in English, it is altogether fitting and proper to give one's life for one country. Dolce et decorum est pro patria mori. I remember that dimly, and I believe that when I joined the Air Corps at the age of 17 as a reservist, too late to fly and fight, which I wanted to do. I have flown ever since, which I love. Helicopters flying the dead man's curve, as I said many times before, too low and too slow for safe auto rotation. And that's like being in a war zone, because if you lose power, you die. In a war zone, somebody shoots an RPG at you, and you're dead. You're in an armored Humvee. You're with a, a, a group of, uh, of soldiers, and yet you happen to get picked out by accident, and both of you pass, pass on. And so I honor these people, and I say to those who say, 
Do not honor the warriors. Do not honor the people that go to war. We must have peace and not do anything that can harm peace. And I say to them, I agree. But we also must understand that without these warriors giving their lives, we would not be here to demonstrate the peace. I have covered every major peace march in Manhattan when I was there, all during the Vietnam War. Dozens, hundreds of thousands of people out. And yet, when we went to Central Park and I listened to them and they spoke about peace, I would ask somebody, well, how do you get peace? The world is always in flames. There are many wars. There are many countries that would like to destroy us and each other. What do you do? How can you stop the wars? And the only answer I ever got was, there's a better way. Well, of course there is, but I don't know what it is. I do know that human beings are highly emotional, that they function by emotions, that rationality gives way to paranoia and gives way to adrenaline and all the things that cause people to kill each other. And yet these same people, when they're calm, seem very rational. And when I watch any demagogue, even here in our current election in the United States, rousing young people to becoming highly emotionally involved in a cause, I realize it's dangerous because young people have trouble controlling their emotions more than older people, and all people have trouble controlling their emotions. So again, I return to why I started this conversation, to David Guilty and to his, his companion, the uh, photojournalist and interpreter, I believe it's Tanneman, I take my hat off and salute you. You gave your lives for what you believed in. And again, I ask for a moment of silence. Thank you.